Hello and welcome to my new video. Today we will look at different ways of decompiling a droid application and we will receive our first hands-on experience with static analysis in reverse engineering. For this video I've created a simple Android application to show you the difference between how the app looks for the developer and how it looks for the reverse engineer. First let me show you the app itself in Android Studio. It has main activity with several buttons. The first one leads to another activity, the second button loads the file from assets, the third button loads a URL in the web view, and the last button simply exits the app. The second activity is a transition step between main and third. I added it to demonstrate the communication flow between activities. The third activity serves as a fragment holder. It's important to note that uh, during reverse engineering, activities and fragments may look quite different. In the app, one fragment receives information passed via intent, while another fragment receives data passed through a chain of classes. There are several points of interest here. The intent-based information passing mechanism will inspect how to find and analyze data passed via intents. The class-based data passing mechanism will trace it step by step to understand how to follow a chain of method calls. And there is also intentionally added dead code, so you will see how unused parts of an app look from the reverse engineering perspective. Now let me also show you the app dynamically, so you will better understand what's happening. As I've said, there are four initial buttons. Now let's open the URL in the web view. You can see that Wikipedia website has been loaded. Now let's go back and load the assets file also in the web view. And you can see that the HTML file, which I created intentionally, has been successfully loaded. Now let's proceed to second activity and from there move to third activity with fragments. In the first fragment, you will see one text view and in the second fragment, another text view. The strings inside the text views will be the one we search for during our static code analysis. One more thing I'd like to show you is how to check the app's logs. We can do it by setting up a filter in Android Studio while running the app in the emulator or on the device. To do this, open the logcat tab in Android Studio, make sure the correct device is selected and in the filter section type package and your app package name. This way all logs generated by the application will be visible. I've intentionally placed logs with the Android X-ray tag in each activity and fragment so you can see clearly them in action. So let's begin analyzing the APK. First, I want to remind you of what I showed in my previous video, that you can simply change the app's extension from .apk to .zip, and in this way you can open it via any archive manager. Let's try it. I renamed the APK to a zip file, and now you can see that it has an archive icon, meaning we can open it using WinRAR or 7-zip. Inside, we can see the app's structure folders like assets and resources, the classes .dex file and other data. However, most of this content is not human readable. For example, you cannot easily read the classes .dex and even XML files are encoded. That's why a much better way to unpack APK is to use dedicated tools like APK tool. APK tool decompiles and decodes the APK, making its content much more readable. I'll now show you how to install APK tool. To install APK tool, open your browser and simply search for APK tool. Go to the official APK tool website and click on the install tab. There you will see the full installation guide which we will follow now. Important note, having Java installed is a required prerequisite. First we will need to download the wrapper script. Click the provided link, open the file in your browser, right click on the page and choose save as. Save this file anywhere you like with the name apktool.bat. Next, click on other links that leads to the version catalog. From there, download the latest release and rename the downloaded file to apktool.jar. On the official site, they suggest placing these files into the Windows folder. However, that doesn't always work reliably. Instead, we will put them into a dedicated folder and add this folder's path to the system environment variables. To do this, let's create a folder in the system directory to store the related files. I open the C directory and create a folder named apk tools there. To add it to the system variables, first copy the path of the folder. Then press win plus R, type sysdm.cpl and hit enter. In the system properties window, go to the advanced tab and click environment variables. Under system variables, select path, then choose edit, new and paste the copied path. Finally, click ok on all windows to apply changes. We can now test it to confirm it's working. Now apk tool is ready to use. Let's try it now with our APK. To decompile an app, we will use the command apk tool d name of apk dot apk. As you can see, we now get an output folder containing the decompiled resources of the app. Let's check the assets folder first. Inside, we see an index.html file used in web view and also a config.json file, which I intentionally placed here as an example. You see that these files inside the assets folder are preserved in their original form just as the developer put them. Now let's proceed to the smiley folder. All text files have been decompiled into a smiley code. Using any text editor, for example Virtual Studio Code, we can read and inspect these files. Smiley is a human readable code extracted from text files, 
though it's not that easy to follow it as a decompiled Java code, which we will see later with JDEX. We can also check the Android manifest.xml file. Unlike before, this file is now properly decoded and can be opened even with something similar as Notepad. So APK tool gives us a way to fully decompile an app's resources and extract smiley code from DEX file. In contrast, simply renaming an APK to zip leaves most resources unreadable. That's why APK tool is essential for reverse engineering. Another option, though it's not recommended for serious reverse engineering, is to use online APK decompilers. Let's try one. If you search in Google for Android APK decompiler, you will see plenty of websites offering this service. Let's proceed to the first of them. We upload our APK, click upload and decompile and wait for it to finish. Once processed, we will receive a downloadable archive. Inside this archive, there are usually two folders, resources and sources. In the sources folder, we will find the apps decompiled Java code and in resources, the other decompiled APK assets. So yes, it actually works similarly as APK tool. But the big drawback is that you are sharing the APK, including its code and structure, with a third-party server. And this can potentially expose sensitive or private information. That's why I don't recommend using online decompilation tools for regular Android reverse engineering tasks. They are fine for quick experiments, but for a serious reverse engineering tasks, better stick to local tools like APK tool or JDEX. Now let's proceed to the main tool of today's video, JDEX. JDEX is a free, open source tool that allows you to decompile Android applications and their DEX files into a readable Java source code. It comes with both graphic interface and command line tool. To install JDEX, go to its official GitHub page and scroll down to the download and install section. Note that JDEX requires Java to be installed as a prerequisite. From the GitHub release page, download the latest version of JDEX. Look for the JDEX.zip file and make sure it's the main file, not the GUI or CLI only versions since the main one includes both graphic interface and command line tool. Once downloaded, unzip the archive. Inside we will find the bin directory containing the launcher files, JDEX for the command line tool and JDEX GUI for the graphical interface. You can run these files directly, but to make things easier, let's add JDEX to the system path. Copy the path of the bin folder, press win plus R, type sysdm.scpl and hit enter. Go to the advanced tab, environment variables. Under System Variables, select Pass, click Edit, New, and paste the path you copied. Click OK on all windows, and now let's test it. Open the command prompt and type jdex-h. If everything is set up correctly, you will see the Help menu. And as you can see, it works, so we are now ready to use JDEX. Before we dive in, let's clarify the difference between uh, command line tool and graphic user interface. Command line interface is for running commands from the terminal. It's useful for scripting, batch decompilation, or automation. For example, this command decompiles an APK into a folder, jdex-d, output folder, name of apk.apk. Graphic user interface is much more visual and beginner friendly. Since our today's focus is on learning and studying, we will mostly use the graphic user interface. Let's launch JDEX with this command, jdex-gui. When JDEX opens, you will see a clean interface where you can drag and drop APK files for decompilation. Before doing that, let's adjust the appearance. Go to File, Preferences and look for the Sim and Editor Sim options. There are plenty of choices, so pick what you like best. Personally, I prefer a dark theme. Now that the interface is comfortable to use, let's load our sample APK. I simply drag and drop the APK into the JDEX window and within a few seconds it is fully decompiled. You will notice a lot of folders appeared in the left panel. Many of these are automatically generated code, Android framework components and third-party libraries. If we open the .com folder, we will find the decompiled code of our app inside the com.androidxray.example application. But here is an important question. What if you don't know the package name of the app you are investigating? That's where android manifest.xml file comes in. You can always find it in the resources folder and its structure always remains the same. It cannot be obfuscated or encoded. Keep in mind that class and package names may be obfuscated by the developer, but the manifest is always accessible. Before diving into the code, the very first step in reverse engineering an APK is always checking the android manifest.xml file. As mentioned, you will find it in the resources folder and it will never be encrypted. The manifest contains essential information about the app, the app's package name, the launcher activity and the permissions required by the application. Let's check them one by one. In my sample app, the package name is com.androidxray.example application. This tells us where to start looking in the decompiled code tree. The second thing to check is the launcher activity because this is the entry point where the app is opened. 
launcher activities will always have main and launcher intent filters. Some applications may have several launcher activities, but the majority of apps have one standard launcher activity. We can see that the launcher activity of my app is main activity located in activities folder. In a moment we will proceed to it. However, there is one more important thing to check in Android manifest. Permissions required by the app. Apps with many permissions, especially powerful ones like bin device admin, may have dangerous or intrusive functionality. On the other hand, apps with no permissions are usually very limited and cannot do much harm. In my app you will see two permissions listed. Internet one, which is actually used because the app loads URL in the web view and camera one, which is not actually used, but I added it intentionally to show you that even unused permissions will be listed in Android manifest. The camera permission also creates a hardware requirement entry, meaning that the app will be marked as requiring camera capable device, even though it doesn't really use this feature. Now let's proceed to the launcher activity. JEDEX allows you to do it easily just by double clicking on the name of the activity in the manifest. It works with any activity, not only with the launcher one. Or we can find the activity manually just by opening the chain of folders. Now we see that the compiled main activity of my app. Also pay attention that you can reveal the class in the left menu to see all its methods and variables. As you can see the code looks a bit different from how it looks in Android Studio. We can see that the Kotlin code was transformed into Java and there are plenty of additional elements that appeared. Annotations, synthetic methods like onCreate Lambda, and comments inserted by JDEX. That happens because when the app is compiled and then decompiled, additional code appears that is not visible when you write the application, especially in Kotlin, since Kotlin generates wrappers under the hood. So let's inspect everything step by step. If you look on the onCreate method, we will see that for each button's click listener, an anonymous class or lambda is being created, which then calls a separate synthetic method like onCreate lambda with the related logic. That is actually how Java represents the logic of click listeners under the hood. So if we were investigating an application in a real world scenario, we would check what is inside on click of each button. The first click listener uses intent put extra to pass some information. Upon checking it, we can see that it passes the string uh, intent chain start, which equals to hello via intent from main activity. Let's now continue investigating this flow. We can see that this information is being passed via intent as an argument to another activity, second activity. We can proceed to it easily thanks to the JDEX convenient functionality. Simply click on the activity name and then press D button on your keyboard, which means go to definition. In this way, we will proceed directly to second activity. We can see the similar flow there, since I intentionally made this activity as a transit one. It also implements a click listener and starts a new intent again, passing the same string argument it received from the main activity to the third activity. The third activity initializes the first fragment and passes the string from the intent to it. We can now proceed to the fragment to see how it uses the received string. And here in the on create view of first fragment, we can see how it obtains the string from the arguments and set it to the text view. So we have successfully found how the string from the text view appears. It is a simple but good example of reverse engineering investigation flow. Sometimes the task may be opposite when you don't know the string but you know the place where it is used. Such as example is prepared in second fragment. Let's proceed to it. As you can see there is also a text view which receives some text to set. We can see that it comes from the method get search string from class 3. We proceed to it also by clicking on it and pressing D on the keyboard. We now can see the class and its method. Here is an important thing to clarify. You can see that this class has the field search string class 3, which equals to the method result of another class. And there are three methods get search string class 3, set search string class 3, and get search string from class 3. The first two methods are automatically generated getters and setters by Kotlin, since with Kotlin you don't need to write these methods explicitly. The method get search string from class 3 was created manually by me in the code. I even had to add the word from to the method name since it's not possible to compile a PK with the names like get search string class 3. Those names are reserved by the compiler for property accessors. So we are interested in the method I've created manually, get search string from class 3. It returns the field search string class 3, which equals to the result of another class methods. Let's proceed to it. This class looks the same, we repeat the flow. We check the get search string from class 2 method, see that it returns search string class 2, which equals to the result of another class method. And finally we proceed to the first class, and we can see that it's get search string from class 1 method, returns the string search string class 1, which equals to this is the search string. So in this way we found the needed string by investigating different classes and their methods. These are very common techniques in reverse engineering and I hope these examples gave you a good understanding of how this flow works on the practice. Now let's return to the main activity and check on click methods of other buttons. We can see the flow related to loading of file from assets. It creates an intent to the web view activity since this activity will be showing the asset file and it passes the file name as an argument. The web view activity has a simple 
simple logic to check the argument and handle the possible null values. We are actually interested in the assets file itself. We saw that its name is index.html, so we proceed directly to the assets folder and open the index.html file. We can see its simple structure and in this way we can check any file in the assets of apk. I've also added a simple json file just for an example and we can also check it. And you can see that it is a very simple json file. However, real apks may contain hundreds of assets files and they may be obfuscated or encoded. But for now, these examples are enough. Let's return to the main activity and see what the next button does. We can see that it also starts web view activity and passes the Wikipedia URL to it as an argument. Nothing special here, just an example of how intents can be checked. And finally, the last button just simply exits the application using method finish affinity. Another important thing I wanted to show you is how that code looks in the code of the compiled APK. And also I wanted to show you how you can use functionality for searching code and the cross references in JDEX. Here we can see the unused class which I created intentionally and it is not used anywhere in the app, so it is actually a dead code. It is still present in the APK since the compiler doesn't remove the dead code automatically even though it doesn't have any references. Now I want to show how the cross reference function works in JDEX. We may click on the class or method name, the same as when we press D on the keyboard to go to its definition. But instead, we will press the X button, which shows the cross-references of this class or method. If we check the cross-references of this unused class, it will not show anything since it's not used anywhere. However, if we proceed to the web view activity, for example, and click X on it, we will see that it is called twice from main activity, which we already observed before. Let's also check it with the method, for example, one of the synthetic on create lambda function. It shows that it is called from the main activity from the anonymous class generated from the on click logic. This demonstrates how you can search and verify how different methods and classes are used uh, throughout the application. Another important thing I wanted to show you is a general search in JDEX. To use it, we press the combination of buttons, which are Ctrl plus Shift plus F which reveals a window with search parameters. JDEX allows you to set search scope, for example, classes, code, comments, and so on. And also it allows to use regular expressions and case sensitive search. Let's use the following regex expression, which will find all results with HTTP and HTTPS strings. As you can see, we found our Wikipedia URL and the results. And if we click on it, we jump directly to its usage. But you may ask, why do we see another results if we didn't put them in our code? The reason is that the compiled APK also includes code for Android framework, libraries, SDKs or other important tools. In most cases you are not interested in those results. That is a legitimate code that cannot be influenced by the developer. So in general you should focus on the app's own package name. When you are a beginning reverse engineer, this may be a bit overwhelming since you don't understand where the app's code and where is legitimate system or SDK's code. But don't worry, with this experience we will quickly recognize system or library's code and we'll focus on what really matters. And at the end of this video, let's check the resources folder. We can see the layouts, let's check for example the layout of main activity. We can see the typical layout file parameters successfully decompiled. Also, let's check drawables folder to see the image that was present in the app. We open drawable folder and see our JPEG file. We may click on it and view it. So that's it for this video. We successfully iterated through tools which allow you to decompile application and also check main functionalities of JDEX. I hope this video was helpful to you and helped to understand things better. If it was, please put your like and subscription and if you have any ideas or suggestions, leave them in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.